coming from its neighbor, North Korea. Joining us for details is VOA Seoul correspondent Bill Gallo. Bill, what can you tell us? Well, North Korea fired what appears to be three projectiles, probably short-range rockets, into the sea off its east coast. We don't have a lot of details, but it appears that these were fired from the eastern part of the country into the ocean, and this is their second launch in the past week. Any speculation as to why they're ramping it up now in the midst of uh, all the other crises all over the world with the coronavirus? <laughs> There's a lot of speculation, and the answer is nobody knows. I mean, the past week has been quite inconsistent and erratic, even by North Korean standards. We have on last Monday, two short-range missiles being launched. Then on Tuesday, Kim Jong-un's sister released a letter that is blasting South Korea's presidential office. It's idiotic. Hmm. Then on Thursday, Kim Jong-un sent a letter to South Korea talking about, you know, the wonderful friendship they have, and it was a very conciliatory letter. And now we have another missile launch. So there's a lot of mixed messages going on here. And this, of course, comes as people believe that North Korea is dealing with what is likely to be its own coronavirus outbreak. So we just don't know about that part of it, do we, because of the secretive nature of that nation? Yeah, we basically know nothing about what is going on in, in North Korea regarding the coronavirus. They have not reported any cases. However, that seems unlikely, given their proximity to China. North Korea did shut the border down, or attempt to shut the border down with China, basically sooner than anyone else did, as soon as this outbreak happened in January. But there's a lot of holes in that border. They rely on trade with China. It seems unlikely that they could have kept the virus out completely. Well, regarding these projectiles, it sounds like these were personally overseen by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Are you hearing any analysts over there in South Korea with any sort of speculation as to why he's ramping this stuff up again now? We don't know yet many details about the specifics of this launch, but it appears to be short range. And the reason I say that is because South Korea's military says that three missiles, uh, excuse me, three projectiles were fired this morning. That is consistent with what they have done repeatedly over the past year with these short-range multiple rocket launchers. They usually launch two. Sometimes they attempt three at the same time. So these are short-range. They pose a big danger to South Korea and to U.S. troops, but they're not the kind of provocations that could totally upend diplomacy with the United States, which is sort of non-existent for now anyway. But the bottom line is Donald Trump has not not reacted firmly to these types of launches in the past, and he is unlikely to do so this launch. Well, it sounds like uh, a number of EU nations, including Britain, Germany, France, Belgium, Estonia, are going to the UN Security Council over this, or they already did last week. Yes, and this is pretty standard behavior because these launches by North Korea violate UN Security Council resolutions. Even if the United States right now isn't too upset about these launches, Donald Trump consistently plays them down. Many European nations are concerned because it violates international law. In North Korea, of course, every time this happens, they get very sensitive to those types of accusations and they release angry statements. They did so in this case as well, but it's sort of a, a pattern that seems to just escalate and escalate and escalate. We don't know where it will end at this point. Right, that's a VOA sole correspondent, Bill Gallo. Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders each picked up significant endorsements for their presidential bids over the weekend. AP correspondent Ben Thomas reports. I have decided that I am with great enthusiasm going to endorse Joe Biden. Senator Kamala Harris joins a cluster of one-time rivals for the nomination, posting a video statement right. Sunday. We need a leader who really does care about the people and who can therefore unify the people. And I believe Joe can do that. I stand with Bernie Sanders today. But at a rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Bernie Sanders picked up his own endorsement from the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Him, he's never lost his case for justice for the people. And Sanders tells ABC's this week he's not surprised to see the Democratic establishment rallying around. We're all winning the support of grassroots America because we have an agenda that speaks to working people. I'm Ben Thomas. Sunday was International Women's Day, and it has also been 100 years since the 19th Amendment was passed, giving women the right to vote in the United States. To commemorate the centennial, the New York Historical Society has launched a special exhibit called Women March. It explores women's collective action before and after the suffrage victory all the way into the 21st century. Louis Penelope Pulu visited the exhibit and spoke with the curators. 
The exhibit, Women March of the New York Historical Society in New York City, takes a visitor along 200 years of women's collective action in American history. Photographs, drawings, and archival video footage bring their activism to life. It started as early as the 1820s, says the society's Valerie Paley. Women came together as these moral arbiters of a new nation and, uh, and were speaking out against slavery and Indian removal and all sorts of issues by uh, lending their names to petitions, in a way, a proto-women's march, if you will. 100 years later, the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920 granted women the right to vote. A digital interactive map shows the 19th Amendment was not inclusive. It took decades before all American women could vote, with wealthy white women being the first and black women in the South enjoying the same right only after the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. And though white women and black women formed a coalition during that period, their perspectives were often divided along racial lines, says Pamela Walker, a team member of the exhibit. One thing that was really significant and really important for this exhibition is to show that in any movement for women's rights and women's liberation, that there will always be tension, that women are coming from different perspectives, whether you're a white woman or a Latinx woman or um, an, a black woman. The latter part of the exhibit focuses on women's collective action from the 1970s through today. During this period, women marched to demand legal rights equal to men. They also marched on issue-driven topics such as gun control and reproductive rights, says Kirin Wismer, another team member of the exhibit. One thing that I think the Women's March of January 2017 and subsequent women's marches did was bring together an incredibly diverse group of women who share the identity of being women, but also have a multitude of other identities. Women of color, women in the gay community, and feminists of all genders all marched together in cities all over the world one day after President Trump was inaugurated in 2017 to send a message that women's rights are human rights. Since then, women marched on a broad swath of issues such as climate change, gun violence, sexual assault, and sexual discrimination. Women from all walks of life come together through digital technology and form global internet movements such as hashtag MeToo. Caitlin Wisner says the exhibit shows that securing the vote 100 years ago was just the beginning. The idea that beyond the vote, beyond many legal hallmarks of equality, we always must keep safeguarding what we have fought so hard for. Penelope Pulu, VOA News, New York City.